ballet is something that's so often misrepresented and um, and sort of it sort of just becomes a story of like eating disorders and um, I mean not that these things don't exist in ballet but it does sort of or like backstage drama and divas and uh, it rather sort of diminishing of the athleticism of it and I wanted to make sure that that was in there too. Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to interview where our guest today is Megan Abbott, whose latest thriller, The Turnout, had me twirling with all kinds of twists. Fun to see that was announced this morning as the latest Read with Jenna book club selection, their first mystery, which I found really interesting. I have enjoyed your books for such a long time, and I've been so looking forward to finally being able to talk to you. So welcome, Megan. So nice to have you here. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I feel like we always run into her each of each other in sort of brisk little media, you know, at conferences or BEA or something, and it's always so quick. So it's great to have an excuse to sit down and chat. Exactly. And it's like without anybody to interrupt us. Nobody's gonna ask us for a drink, your autograph, anything like that. This is even better. It really is, you know. So let's start by you telling us about the turnout because I know I can't do this justice. So you're on. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's essentially the story about these two sisters, Dara and Marie, and they were sort of raised in ballet. Their mother had started this ballet school that they have inherited, and they run it together with Dara's husband, Charlie. And, you know, they're very close, the three of them. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of, they live their whole lives together. They work together. They you know, it's, it's very intense. Um, and with the beginning of the book, Marie, the, the unmarried sister, as they used to say, is sort of starting to, to pull away a little bit. She's moved out of the house. Um, and as they're ramping up for their big money maker, which is their annual production of the Nutcracker, um, there's a fire in the studio. It's not a spoiler. It's very early in the book. Um, and they need to hire our contractor to renovate. Um, and they hire this charismatic fellow named Derek and uh and he's trouble <laughs> and, and from there um yeah things things get really complicated and all kinds of family secrets come forward and uh all heck breaks loose <laughs> and then megan gets a hold of them and everybody goes in these derelict twisty little directions yeah it's like and i also love it's the durant score of dance you know what i mean it's very you know Sure. Yes, indeed. It was, I went to the Casale School of Dance in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, and it had it was the strip mall, but it had a similar kind of exotic energy to me. So I, that's where it comes from. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to go back to your early ballet teachers. Mine was um, it was in somebody's basement someplace on some side street in Bloomfield, New Jersey. OK, so we go and the only thing I remember is um, at the big recital that everybody goes to, everybody's into dancing and stuff like that. I leave and I say to my parents, the lights were pink, blue, yellow, green up on top. I didn't do any of the moves. I remember shuffle, shuffle, ball, chain was a lot of fun. Ballet was boring, <laughs> but very short career. Very, very short career. So I, how long was your career long? It was very short. I was going to say, I switched to tap. So I understand the shuffle ball stuff. Uh, um, I really loved it so much, but I just just could, couldn't do it. And it was not in me. And I felt so, um, it was so, you know, you're, it's mirrors all around you. I had this beautiful ballet teacher who was two sisters who ran this school I went to too. And they were so beautiful. And, you know, me as an eight year old and uh, with a little, you know, little sort of pigeon breasted eight year old in her leotard, just, it just felt like I will never make, I'll never get that far. It will never happen for me. So that was the extent of it. But I'm, I've always loved going to the ballet and I always hoped one day I'd get to write about it. Yeah, so watching others is like a really good thing. Yeah. I also have this childhood scar where they were taking the picture before, you know, the, before the big performance, they were doing the picture of all the kids and my mother hadn't dyed my little shoes yet gold. So I have little red slippers on and everyone else has their little shoes. And I see that picture and I just remember that day of, I don't have the right things because that's what ballet was. You had to have everything right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You were supposed to look so uniform um, and that, that's sort of part of it. So yeah, you, everyone probably thought you were trying to stand out. 
<laughs> it was totally on me. It was totally on me. <laughs> so there's a lot here about sisters. Do you have a sister for starters? Do you, or it was imagination? <laughs> it, was, it was, I mean, I, I, only, I have a brother, no sisters. And I always imagined what it would be like to have a sister, especially, um, you know, but whether the older or the younger, the dynamic that takes shape um, and the intensity of that. Cause I always had a little bit um, less pressure in my case, having a brother. Um, but it always feels so um, complex and intricate. And it's always hard to figure out what's really going on between sisters because it is like so many layers deep. And uh, so that, that made me want to write about it. Yeah, and there's definitely history. There's lots of history going on here and what they know and what they don't know. And there, you rock the character balancing act with the introduction of Charlie, like Charlie coming into this whole scene and his role with the sisters in their early life and now is really interesting. So let's talk about Charlie because he's like slightly damaged, but they turn to him. Yes, I mean, he was their um, mother's protege as a young dancer when he was you know, 12, 13, 14. And he, he came and lived with them, um, uh, which, which often happens with very talented dancers, of course, they need to be where the best teachers are. Um, and then, he and Dara end up um, falling in love as teenagers and getting married. And um, and it's sort of, um, something happens to their parents, which is also a spoiler, it's on the first page. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, essentially they become uh, this triad and it's sort of like Dara and Charlie become almost like Marie's uh, mother and father. Um, you know, Marie is more of a wild child. And, but Charlie at a certain point as happens with so many dancers, um, injuries have taken their toll on him. He can't dance anymore. He can't even really teach. And so it's, um, it is, I wanted to explore that, that which is so, so common for competitive dancers is that they are sort of suffer with these injuries for, for the rest of their life and how hard it is because they put, it takes such a toll on your body to perform a lot. Mm -hmm. especially at a young age when your body's still building and they've destroyed something along the way and he's taking all kinds of painkillers he's got a lot going on and so at the same time there's this contractor who um, arrives at the most inconvenient time he has a very key role and he immerses himself into these characters lives it's far more than the contractor though all of a sudden anybody who's had a contractor at their house knows how <laughs> they immerse themselves but not quite like this was he always set up to be like that? Did you always know there's going to be three and then the fourth was going to come in? Or did this happen as you're writing? No, I knew. I really wanted him in there. I really love that dynamic where there's a very sort of hot house, a very close community, a very close community mm -hmm. as well. And an outsider comes in and has such a different energy. I mean, Derek is like a booming voice. He's, he's big. He's, you know, he's got a belly. He's got a physique. He's, he's a loud talker. And, and when you think of ballet studios, um, they're so quiet and they're almost like church. And there's sort of this, this um, real reserve. And he is sort of the opposite of that. And then also, I was so interested about having a contractor in your space because there is something invasive about it at its best but you also are so vulnerable because no one ever really knows what contractors are doing unless you know something about construction so you have to put your trust and faith in them so I, that was sort of seemed like such a fraught dynamic especially for people as private as Dara and, um, and Charlie in particular who have never Dara and Charlie Marie they've never really ventured out into the world their whole their you know their world is really their home and their studio so to have this guy come in um um, and, and disrupt things is uh, really shakes things up. And he's saying, they're going, well, this is what I need to do. They know nothing about what he's talking about. And I remember years and years, oh my gosh, it's gotta be like 12 years ago now, we redid the office in New York and the contractor said, and you can just go home and come back in three weeks. And I said, and that's your dream. <laughs> I, said, I am going to be here. I know what I'm doing. And it was really funny because usually they're just talking to you and you have no idea. Like when he says, I've got to do such and such with the floor, they're like, okay. And it makes all this noise while they're trying to rehearse, you know? So there's yeah. It's like a you know, mechanic and plumbers and like a great contractor is gold because you do like you don't really understand what even their best. Um, and it's so something so private about it, I suppose. There's something that can feel very um, it can make you very self-conscious and vulnerable. And I think that's what it does for Dara. Whereas Marie just loves, she, she takes to that uh, kind of explosive energy. So uh, it's a little different for her. 
you know, there's somebody on the, on the premises for her that's not these two, and it's not these children they have to coddle, and these parents they have to be nice to, and instead it's somebody, oh wait, this can be my person, and it's so funny how she magnetizes, like, zoop, like, this is going to be my guy, and you're like, your whole life you've lived this very reserved, no, immediately, yeah. like this butterfly <laughs> coming forward, you know? So yeah. I think- I think when people think of ballet, they always think of the Nutcracker. It always comes to mind. So was it a no brainer that that was going to be part of the plot? Like there is, that's the story. Well, I, I was fascinated. I read that really that is how, that is how dance schools function. That is how they make all their money. That's how, not just in terms of ticket sales in the community, but that's when girls enroll Mm -hmm. in dance school because they want to be the nutcracker and it's it's a story about a young girl on the precipice to womanhood and it's it's so beautiful and now it's been attached to the holiday um which you know but you know it it has all this sort of enchantment to it so there was it was it was perfect to use especially because when i read the original story it's based on which i had never read by eta hoffman it's this very dark fairy tale and um it's not at all the Balanchine Ballet, um, but you, but the the residue of that is in there. If you really think about it, if you really think about it as being this young girl who, who's sort of overly attentive godfather <laughs> um, who has an eye patch gives her this little man this nutcracker that she then goes to bed with <laughs> it's a stranger story than any of us i think remember so then once i started to read into all of that i thought i gotta use this we were on the sugar plum fairies and then we're like wait a second this is a little bit strange this man's handing this child a, you know i sat there and i thought about it they're like mm, i see what she's talking about you know You also, there's, I'm also going to say the physicality of dance, physicality, we're making that up as a word, whether that's a word or not, I don't care, (laughs) is something I was thinking about. And I was Googling because you described so well how the dancers break their toe shoes and how their feet, I mean, I was actually Googling dancers feet, I'll be perfectly honest, and broken toe shoes to just get the idea of what that was all like. I feel like that it's punishing and it contributes to the tension of the book because when you're when you are describing all of those scenes while the rest of the tension's building you realize the tension that the dancer's going through as well am i right on that one that's that's what you're doing yeah and i think it cuts both ways i mean one of the things that's fascinating to me about dancers with their feet and with i mean you probably saw there's like a hundred thousand youtube videos about dancers showing how they break in their toe shoes and they each have their own ritual for it and it's very violent so in in some ways it expresses sort of what's the, the sort of toll of their body but they're all it's also very empowering for them they have taken ownership of these shoes they're making the shoe fit their foot and their foot only and i I think it's that sort of contradiction um, that was so interesting to me because it is a powerful image and mm-hmm. and what they do to their feet is is to us it's sort of there's something sort of ah about it but it's actually what makes this beautiful thing and and there's sort of a source of pride there's something about wearing your battle scars I think that um, is, is rather enticing too. Yeah and I saw that because I was I was just thinking of like, how does the shoe get constructed around your foot? What do you do to make it work for you? And your toes are like, and also you don't start, start um, children, remember, in point too young because oh. it will affect the growth of their feet. So I remember that too. In fact, the reviewer um, for this book that we have is somebody who dances. Oh. And, he, and, and immediately, it was funny because I was hoping she would select it because our reviewers select the books. And I was so excited she selected. I was like, okay, this is somebody who understands dance, you know? Yeah. Yes, I had a, I had a, um, at the end of, when I was finished the book, I had a dancer read it for, to make sure that I didn't get anything wrong. Um, and it was so satisfying um, um, because if she was a dancer, she was able to find a few things that she thought were just not expressed quite right. But I was so pleased that she, I got off like, I mean, she, it was, it was, it was minimal. And it, I think it was because I really do respect so much what they put into it and ballet is something that's so often misrepresented and um and sort of it sort of just becomes a story of like eating disorders and um Mm -hmm. i mean not that these things don't exist in ballet but it does sort of or like backstage drama and divas and uh, rather sort of diminishing of the athleticism of it Mm -hmm. i wanted to make sure that that was in there too and one thing you describe really well is the ballet move called the turnout 
And if you could just tell us a little bit about that one, because I did not know that turn. I mean, I saw the, you know, the title of the book, but I did not realize that was a ballet term. So tell us about that, because that's something you work to achieve. You work to try yeah. to do that. Yes, it's, you know, we've all seen dancers put their, their, you know, toes out like this, but really what a turnout is, is from your hip to your toes, be, getting at 180 degree angle, which is, you know, if we, any of us tried it, we would think is physically impossible. There's this sort of, it takes a, a lot of work for most dancers, but it's really the whole form. Mm -hmm. um, so much of ballet depends upon at least classical ballet. And it is a kind of opening up gesture to the audience. It has all kinds of significance, um, and it is this this thing that you have to work towards, and that can be quite painful to stretch your muscles that way over time to, to get it. So it was not originally the title. I don't know why I didn't think of it as the title. It was very late in the process, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's right there. Yeah, it's right there. It's how things turn out. It's the whole thing. It just completely yeah. works. Lots of other connotations. I mean, it is a term of prostitution as well, and, um, <laughs> uh, being turned out. Um, but it, it had all kinds of, you know, other balances that that made it sort of perfect. Sometimes, sometimes titles come early. Sometimes they come late. <laughs> you, what was your working title? Can you remember what your working was? It was uh, We Three. Um, okay. So much about the triad of Dara, Charlie, and Marie, um, but but I was never really happy with it. It was always sort of a working title. So, mm -hmm. um, um, so but when I Allison and I thought it should be the turnout, and I I said to my editor, she said, of course it should. And we both were sort of in this moment. <laughs> it's like, oh wow, that we're like done. Okay, that part's done. That's like check that off the list. You know, I also have seen there's this real tension between what the audience sees in the ballet. And this cutthroat backstage drama, even among these little diva girls, I mean, just being mean to the girl who's in the title role and the battles between the dancers. Did you plot out that tension in advance as well? Or did you plot? Let's get, do we plot at all? <laughs> I definitely plot the main story. That I didn't have to plot. As you may know, having read some of my other books, I'm quite familiar with, me, with that dynamic. In fact, I had to like stop myself from writing more of it. But um, the stakes are really high for these young girls, and they're all very serious about it. And there is can be only one Clara in the Nutcracker. It's really one of those situations. It's not like so many plays or musicals that you do in childhood, where the whole idea is to have lots of parts for lots of people. It's really other than the sugar plum fairy who's often an adult dancer um it really is clara so they're also at the age when in my experience i think this has all changed somewhat but uh, it's the, the girls are meanest is like 10 11 12. to me that was the the time when it, it was the most intensity of it so that part just came so naturally to me i uh i mean there was just no way it wasn't gonna happen but for for the character of bailey who is the Clara um I did want it it did sort of emerge that I wanted it to be a journey for her of sort of getting through this gauntlet just as Dara is getting through a gauntlet of a, on a much more major scale oh the different those two parallels ah I like that when the par the performance unfolds everything from the announcement to the, to the cast like the parents today is the announcement we must go look on the door to the details of staging you capture the parents backstage their roles their non-roles I feel like you had fun with all the drama like putting that all together am I right do you have fun like making that you be mean to you you be mean <laughs> Well, it, it's just, um, I think it's actually one of the most charming things about a community is this kind of stuff that, the, um, you know, in, in where I grew up in sort of suburban Detroit, but, but, you know, pretty, there just wasn't a lot of arts. And there was something so wonderful about having these sort of crown jewels of having a ballet school or whatever is a, a, a children's theater or something. And, and the way that it becomes so important. And that's so lovely if you're not living your major city where you're going to get to go see, uh, you know, I was lucky in New York, I can go to see the New York City Ballet, I can go see, you know, I can go to the opera, I can, but there was nothing really like that. Um, so I think that there's something um, I mean, some of the parents are very difficult, and uh, I also wanted that to get in there, having taught before and knowing a lot of teachers. Sometimes dealing with the parents is far harder than dealing with the students. But I also kind of love that how important in a community um, a production like this can be. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's like everybody's got to get together. I also love that they worry about all the details, like the snow. The snow has got to be perfect. And where you're going to go get the snow, how the snow is going to come down from the ceiling. It was all these little details. And you captured the behind the scenes of the production. And also the fact that it all looks pretty on the stage, but backstage, the costumes are a little tattered. They're a little bit used. It's and I really like the cracks and in the facade behind. Do you like that messy kind of a feeling be on top of the beautiful? Yeah, that's that's my favorite thing. I think it sort of connects back to the feet and the shoes. You know that that um, that it is so much about this sort of pearly perfect facade, but actually, so to me, it's so much more beautiful the messiness of how it really is back there. I mean, I read so much about different productions, small productions of it, and and anytime you read anything about. Uh, like how hard it is to mount a nutcracker production. They always talk about the tree in the snow as being really challenging. Um, and, and you know, like recycling it and, and all of that kind of stuff. So those details, I also feel that the goal there too, really foremost is for the reader to sort of be able to smell and taste and you know, everything to sort of come alive um, uh, um, for the reader so that, you know, the reader feels immersed in that too. So I'm always looking for the odd detail so I can put it in there so you can feel like you're there. Yeah, and I felt, felt like them collecting the snow to use as the next night, how grimy that was going to be by the end because yeah. it's like, you know, and procuring all these little, these things that make the show. They're the little, the essences of it, but how to get that to happen. Yeah. I, I did remember, I'd forgotten this until I was doing another interview. And I remembered that I, when I was in my brief tenure as a ballet dancer, um, we had to do a can-can dance. And I was really excited about it because we were going to get those can-can skirts, you know, with all the ruffles as you, you know, you, know, you push. And, they, and I remember being so disappointed when they arrived because they were they were made so that the lights would illuminate them, but they looked like nothing. Like they were black and they had these sort of bland colored ruffles. And it was, it was, they were designed so that the light would bounce off that and create this sort of fluorescence. But they were so disappointing. Um, you know, the real thing was so disappointing. So that 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 sentiment was probably in there too. Yeah, you know, things can look a little different backstage. Yeah, and I mean, while I was looking at the lights on the ceiling, so I'd have been doing just fine. I would have been doing just great. All their value. <laughs> it's like, here we go. At the same time, there are all these cracks among the protagonists. There's all the stuff that's going on. And there's this push and pull in the whole book, I felt, about who's the hero and who's the villain. Among the sisters, who's the hero, who's the villain. And I feel like you really love playing games with readers' heads because who is really the bad person in this book? And even among the children, just among everybody, like who's right, who's wrong, who's doing what they should and who's not. Am I right that that's something you have fun like playing around with is who's who? Yeah, and sort of that, because I guess I don't believe that, I mean, there really aren't in real life heroes or villains. I mean, there's a few villains, but, you know, but for the most part, we are more ambiguous than that. And, and so the, sort of keeping, you know, sort of giving everyone their moments of grace and their complexity is really important to me so that you can feel very judgmental or angry by the character in one scene. But when you turn it around and you see, you know, what they're, what kind of pressure they're under or what the family history is and you know it is like whenever you you know go and see someone else's family um or you it's like your in-laws or something where you're sort of witnessing another family and you're seeing all, like it could feel really crazy like why are you being so mean to your mom why are you you know but it's because you don't understand all these sort of layers you don't know what this what this person did to this person at that barbecue 10 years ago you don't know who pushed one another in the swimming pool you know it's so i, I really wanted to make sure it had like any family all these sort of layers to unpeel and that it would be fun for the reader to unpeel them and keep changing how they feel about everybody mm -hmm. and then this guy from the outside is he the bad guy is he yeah. what's gonna or or are there other forces within like what's going on back and forth i loved it the other thing is you write in three acts like that's what i'm seeing so tell us about do you plot out the three acts or what's the three acts coming from where's it coming from 
always have plotted with three acts. I think it comes from, you know, really as a kid watching so many movies. I was a big classic Hollywood, you know, before TCM, TCM viewer. And so the way that scripts were structured in that three act way, oh, I think it was really embedded in my brain. So I don't outline, but I do know what the three acts will be. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's a, a little bit of a change, but for the most part, I, I really sort of, I mean, the middle is always the muddy part. Every writer knows that it can get very confusing and you can lose your way. But um, so the middle is often a little mushier, but that is how I think of it. And I always think it's a little tied to my um, early Catholicism too, because there's something about like sin and then purgatory. And and then redemption. redemption. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of that in there too, I think. Was there Catholic school in your past? Was there Catholic? No, school? no, my parents never would do that to me. But, uh, Catholic school here, Catholic school. I still can't even recite their commandments. I'm terrible. I'm like really terrible, you know. Catholics are always the worst at explaining Catholicism. <laughs> it's in us, and we don't know how it got there. But you know, we don't ask us to explain it. <laughs> but we memorized. We memorized in order to get through communion and all the sacraments. We did a lot of memorizing of things we don't remember. <laughs> No, and I still do this, <laughs> so that doesn't leave. <laughs> that doesn't leave at all. That doesn't leave. You know, you're known for dark, writing dark. I mean, I just when I pick up your book, I never think, oh, light and funny. You know, well, it's not going to happen. So, what draws you to that dark side of life? Because you do it so well. Like, will you embed us in with these people? I'm there. Oh, I'm glad. You know, it's funny because I I never really think of it as dark until until other people look at it. So I was always interested in it's even as a kid the things I liked to read as a kid or watch I really liked um you know I really liked flowers in the attic and I really like and I like fairy tales before that and I liked true crime as a little kid um mm-hmm. was really drawn to it and it, it never felt um um I guess that the difference I would say for myself is I do think they're dark books, but I don't think they're bleak. Um, I I tend to think that there's a kind of glamour in darkness that I find fascinating and seductive. And and that's the sort of thing I like to lean into, the sort of messiness messiness that we carry within us, the sort of complexities of the human heart and and these sort of heightened, I, you know, when you're writing crime, you're always getting characters at this most pressureful heightened state. And that's when that's, that's everything feels like that when you're in that state. And I think for the most part, even though few of us would actually say it, we're drawn to it too. I mean, certainly you wouldn't be reading crime fiction if you weren't, right, interested in no. dark stuff. Um, so I think part of it is maybe it, it makes us feel better about, you know, our own sort of you know complicated feelings or the the things that we have been through because it feels like other people have been through it have come out the other side for the most part except when they don't <laughs> except, when, except when they're the body in the dark you know the body in the dirt you know that's something different yeah. you know and it's funny because I love true crime as well and I just find myself completely enthralled with these deep stories of what really happened I mean I think serial back on you know original like the original podcast about a million years ago or four four years ago something like that and you just sit there and you look at these shows of you see all the sides of the person and it's like what is true and what is not and you realize how much can be manipulated to make you feel a different way and in this book it's like what is manipulated and what's real what's really happening Exactly, because it, it's not first person, but we are only in Dara's point of view. And so, um, and I wouldn't call her an unreliable narrator. She's only narrating the way she sees the world. And and you know, she has a very specific way she sees things. Um, and I think that's what's so interesting. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think with true crime, the psychology in it is what's so compelling. And I think there's a reason too that women are the majority audience and readership for true crime. Do you think that women are used to things being hard um, and stories of resilience um, and trauma um, and shame are really, we all know it. Um, And I think there's just, uh, it's a place that we're allowed to think about that stuff um, and not have to put on our smile, put on our sort of facade and, and to really get down in there. And snuff out the truth. Like what's really the truth? I don't think this is really the truth and let's see what happens. Yes. So you've looked at Cheer and Dare Me. I was addicted to the show. Oh, totally addicted, totally addicted. In fact, it's funny because I see The Outsider 
there was the woman who was coming in to coach. She's yes. the outside person. It's She's true. Outsider again. Yeah. Gymnastics in You Will Know Me and ballet. They're all ensemble events, but there's so much internal competition. Does the setup of both the individual performance against the ensemble background something that intrigues you? Because it's yes. the same in all. Boy, that's a great way to put it. I think that's so true. I, I like that these are all the, the sort of tension of being part of a team or a group or a class, or but also um, individual achievement is how the success is ultimately defined. Um, and it's, I mean, there's something so American about that tension too, because there's this notion about team teams, you know, teams, you know, that you know there should be good sportsmanship and there should be camaraderie and all this sort of stuff. But also, this is the country where the individual individual achievement is the most glorified. So I think that has always appealed to me. And also how, um, you know, there's sort of everyone rises if one person does well, but there's really only one top girl. There's really only one gold medalist. Um, um, and there's really only one Clara. So ultimately, that sort of that sort of rises. Um, but when you think of what goes into that, and the number of people involved in making that happen, um, as we've seen with the Olympics um, mm -hmm. the past few weeks. I mean, it's all been, it's been so interesting to watch the Simone Biles um, story unfold and the harsh treatment she's gotten from even some fellow athletes. I mean, she's also been lauded rightly for talking about her decision, um, but that that tension I think came alive in that discussion. Well, you know, it's really interesting when she, when you look back on that one balance beam, I can't remember which one it was, I think, and she fought, you know, yeah. she jumped and whatever, and she just said, described being lost. Yes. And she says, I am lost in my head or whatever, the twisties, you know, whatever they've been talking about. And it was really interesting because there, I think it was New York Magazine had her whole routine in slow motion. And I actually dropped a link into our newsletter last week. And I said, if you watch this at any one point, if she was lost in the air, how she could have been paralyzed or killed herself instantly with what she was doing. And I think that it was very interesting to read your books and then be watching the Olympics and watching these people in real life of what's happening, including her at one point saying, I'm not going to do this next exercise. Tell so-and-so to not get on the plane. She's got an opportunity. So you're, all this stuff is like a novel behind the scenes of it. We're yeah. sitting there, a Megan Abbott novel, The Olympics. <laughs> really uncanny is when I was researching You Will Know Me that the twisties came up a lot. And and I read, there's a wonderful book about um, female athletes. It's called, uh, I always get the title wrong. It's a little odd. It's called Little Girls and Pretty Boxes or Tiny Boxes. It's written by a sports journalist. And it's about gymnasts and ice skaters. But several of the stories are about permanent spinal damage paralysis that mm -hmm. gymnasts um have experienced doing exactly that that they they lost their their center of gravity or they lost that body memory and it's like it, it's terrifying when you really ponder it and of course it's so hard because she makes it look so easy so i think there's this cognitive cognitive dissonance that I think people have because she makes it look so easy. But if they really, when I saw the same graphic, when you really look at it, it, it's, it, it defies physics. This shouldn't work. And if you pause and think about that, and gymnasts always talk about that, if they're aware of it, then it's disaster. So they know, they know what they're doing. It's just like with baseball, they used to call it the yips, you know, with, um, there's, I mean, I think in every, every sport there, um, and there certainly is a dance too, there's that, that can happen, um, but terrifying. Yeah, it's, it was wild seeing it unfold. Uh, I was all. like, if you fell here, you broke that. If you broke here and there you were on your head. I mean, there was no doubt about it. You were going in motion onto your head. And <laughs> Watching that, I'm just there like, where if you don't feel confident, you can't go do that. You just, you know, sit on the sideline and cheer. It's really okay. Cheering is very fine, you know? So speaking of which, this is your 10th book. Does it get any easier to cheer yourself on as you're writing these books? No, it's much harder. You know, that I'm sure you've heard writers say this before, but the first book is so much the easiest because you don't think anyone will ever read it. You can do whatever you want. It's all, all bets are off. And after that, you just, and by the 10th, you know, you, I always look to Laura Lippman, who's sort of written twice the number of books I have and, and then some, but like I've talked to her about like, you're very worried about repeating your 
yourself. You're very worried about, you know, um, what haven't I done? Um, and, and much like the twisties, except not, you have to not think about that. You have to sort of be drawn to what you're drawn to, but it's really hard because you sort of, you know, put yourself out there a number of times and people get, which is great, different ideas about you. Um, and so you you don't really want to be doing, you know, what should be the next book I should be doing. Like, that just seems fatal to creativity to me. So it is really hard to sort of shut, shut that out. Yeah. So this is your first book working with Sally Kim. You've got a new editor this time around. What is working with somebody new brought to your craft? Because when you come in and you're working with somebody new and you're bringing your ideas to them, you had the same agent for a while, but, but now this is somebody who knew has come into the game. What has that meant for you as a writer? Well, it was certain. I loved working with Reagan Arthur, my prior editor. It was wonderful. We'd worked together in many books. So it was, it was you know, like I'd been, we had such a, a rhythm, but I was so responded to Sally. And, you know, we talked about how we would work together, which, you know, I, I early in my career, I wouldn't have known that that could be a conversation you have. But she was so wonderful um, and sort of so intuitive and the way that she would talk about, I mean, there were things that she figured out about the an early draft that felt kind of uncanny. Um, and that's the sort of thing you hope for with an editor where they know the book you want to write and you're not there yet. And they don't want to say too much. Um, I've always been really wary. I, my agent knows this because I he did this to me once. Like I don't like a line edit early on. I don't want like his scribbles over the paper. And you know, like you know, there's just something so um, wonderful when you're you're working with an editor who who gets the book it could be and and is sort of delicately sort of guiding you there and that's how it felt with Sally because I told her about it when I had not written a word yet and so it, there was a, it was really exciting to be on that journey together yeah and it's somebody different I mean it's like Reagan's for years and now it's somebody different and how does this this person going to approach your craft because yeah. it's a really delicate balance it's a balance and I think that Readers don't often know about the balance between the author, the agent, and the editor. And that dance that the three of you do together, and whether your editor is, um, what kind of an editor is it, like a line it, like it really super involved, and whether your agent is that way. Some agents just make deals, or they just help with marketing. But are they really involved in your editorial product? And I think it's really interesting to, when you've got somebody where all those people are working with you to make it the best product. That's right. That's right. And Dan is my agent is always the first reader. And so we've worked together a long time, and <laughs> many arguments. So like we have a really good rhythm now, but it like they are relationships like any other. And you, there are like moments of crisis and things to work through. But if you're all sort of have the same vision, it's you, you get there and then you get shorthand about it and then you get pushed a little bit, which I think is good. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's just invaluable. I mean, I would be a disaster without without both their input because, you know, things can be very clear in my head and they are not at all on, on the page. So I think you know, people talk often about, how there's no, you know, there's no editing and publishing more, but those people are definitely not in publishing because I get, I, get, I get really edited in the best way. So I'm so grateful for it. You know, it's funny. I read a newsletter on Friday night and I read it on Thursday night. And then somebody like puts it in like, you know, the, the format that we're doing or whatever. And I start to read and I'm like, what was I saying there? Like, I can't even figure out what I'm saying, let alone somebody's going to be able to understand it on Saturday morning. And there are times where you just have to take this pullback. And sometimes you can't do it if you're so close to your work. Like I couldn't do it on Thursday night and fix it. It'd have to be like later. So. Oh, true. So, and it's like the minute you leave yeah. your computer out what the problem is too it's the same kind of dynamic you just can get lost in the weeds yeah so how about the chapter titles do you do those along the way or do you go back and have fun dropping those in i don't know if i've ever done them before this book and it was very weird that they were happening i think because of the ballet structure and it had this sort of uh um, I guess I was thinking of it like a, like a program book at the ballet. Um, so it was fun because I, I don't, I mean, I don't think my first book even has chapters. I just, like, I've never really thought that way. Um, but this time it did feel like the three parts felt very distinct and 
and um, it just fell into place rather naturally. And and it was it was fun to think about them. Um, so so that was a that was a new twist. So you can have ten books and still still surprise yourself. <laughs> And I'm going to encourage readers that when you're finished, look at the titles of the three acts and then look at the title ch chapters and see how the story unfolds for you just reading that way, because it does tell a story. It, you completely brought a story to life there. So it was not missed. So the cover is what I call ballet beautiful. Like this is absolutely like a beautiful, beautiful cover. What was the road to get to this cover? Was this immediate or was this something that happened later? Well, it... I mean, it felt immediate because when we all saw it, it was it seemed so perfect. But there was a lot of conversation before because I, I was everyone was really wanted didn't want it to be too too ballet. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, we wanted to suggest the ballet without it feeling like. Um, um, I guess a different kind of book than it was that, you know, there's a, you know, it could have been all pink and it could have had twirling dancers. It could have been, you know, very operatic. And, uh, but I really wanted it to, um, I didn't want to have too much of that. And no, none of us did. And then this just seemed so elegant where if you, if you knew anything about ballet, you would recognize what that is on the cover. But if you didn't know anything about, I mean, so many people have to told me that they didn't know what those pink ribbons were so it was uh and getting the pink just right not too pink it's actually so it, it, it turned out so well but there was a covers are so, so important it's um um it's it's a real torturous process sometimes but this one um it was just right on and i love that the little fray at the edge here it was just every little details there and then against the black i mean that's just against the black it's like okay folks this is what you're looking yeah it's novel just in case you're wondering you know just in case you're wondering so Cassandra Campbell narrates the audio. Did you have a hand in selecting her to do the audio? I did, and no one ever asked me before. It was so nice. Um, I, I, they, they sent a, like a few different people, but she had like a nice, deep, authoritative voice. And for Dara, it's being in Dara's head for the book, I really wanted her to have a sort of Dara energy. <laughs> so, so when I heard her uh, sample, she seemed perfect. Yes, it's like this very, yes, mm -hmm, I'm going to be assuming about the story. Yeah, I'm in charge of the story, not you. Yes. So how long ago did you find this read with Jenna news? Like how long were you keeping this a secret? <laughs> it, was a, it was a few months and it was, tell you, it was hard because um, I didn't even tell my mom. I can, I literally can honestly say I told no one um, because they scared me so much. <laughs> I mean, they didn't, but the, like, you know, you know, my publisher did, <laughs> you know, we can't tell anybody. We have to keep a secret to be very careful with, you know, showing the seal and all that. So I just thought better than to have any doubt. I'm just not going to tell a single soul. Um, so it was very challenging, especially when the pub date changed because of that. And then I didn't want people to think there was some kind of problem. Like I hadn't turned my book in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I did my homework. I really did my homework, everybody. I'm not late. Yeah, no, it's really funny because I saw the date change and I was like, hmm. And when it changes the first week, you're like, hmm, which one? Hmm. It's like really fun. It's really, really fun. But yeah, keeping the secret, you know, I remember Tyra Jones years, years ago um, was picked as an Oprah pick and she said her mother said, what's going on with the book? She said, nothing. <laughs> Is anything happening? No, nothing. Any press? No, nothing. No, no one, no one, mom. No one cares about the book, you know. The closest I got to was the email I had mom this morning and saying uh, uh, 10 minutes before the announcement, turn on the Today Show. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> they're like, wait, the Today Show, like what channel is it on, honey? You know what I mean? Like, mom, it's my big moment. Turn on the Today Show. Yeah. Like, question me now, mom. <laughs> did I miss something? What happened? What did you want me to see? Was it like a cereal commercial, honey? <laughs> her to yell at me later that I had not <laughs> reminded her to sit her on the TV. So, so I got off the hook. <laughs> like who? People to check off mom. Okay. Everybody else you're on your own. You'll figure it out when you figure it out. I also read you're developing this for a limited series. And where are you on that? Like what part of the process? Because at least you have material. It's not like you're making it up as you go. Yes, I've, I, I've already written the pilot and we have a, a director to be named later attached. So it's moving along. It's really, this is the first time I adapted something so quickly after finishing it. So that was uh, an interesting experience. Usually it's a year or so later, you know, but this, um, this was a, uh, um, right when right when the book was 
turned in. Um, we, we got this, we were able to make this deal. So, um, so it, it, it's been really fun and uh, feels like a good moment for limited series. There's been so many uh, the past year that have, have captivated me, I know. So, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But you know, also, I think that you now have a known product, like you've done this before, people know, so they can make the deal with you instead of saying, gee, how's the book going to do that? They know how you're going to do with working with what you've done. Um, when you're sitting there um, writing a novel and you're in writing a scene, are you ever thinking about how it might unfold on the screen as it's adapted as there are two different disciplines? I mean, you, you have to show, not tell, you know, all those kinds of things. As you're writing, are you ever thinking, I'm doing it this way, but later I could do this? No, no. I think that's fatal for me um, because they are so different and I never want to write one. We've all read those. There's some books that read like a screenplay mm -hmm. and they're not, they've just never been my favorite kind. I really want to be in the, you know, the thing you, you, you would not do in traditional way and TV is to really be in the head. That's how I write. And, uh, and I don't want to be writing to try to sell it to Hollywood. Um, but I do think that as someone who has been a movie lover since I was a kid and literally watch, you know, four to five movies a week, I, I do think, you know, when I'm writing, I do think a lot of it like a movie. Um, so I do have a visual picture in my head of the characters of the space. Um, so there, there's probably a little bit of that in there just because I'm picturing the movies I love. I mean, I'm often, you know, directly thinking of, you know, the red shoes or something, you know, a famous ballet movie, um, you know, so that does come in there. Um, but often it's not directly connected at all. It's just some great weird moment in an old film noir that inspires a scene in a book about ballet. <laughs> <laughs> this I remember, boy, that was a really good thing, you know. So you worked on The Deuce for HBO and you were creating, I'm going to read this, creating, executive producing and show running the adaptation of Dare Me, and which I loved. So how has your film work influenced your writing? Like, I mean, there are two totally different disciplines, but how does it influence what you do writing now? I guess it's created this sort of great Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation for me. They, they are so different and moving back and forth has been, especially during the pandemic, because I have a couple other TV projects that, that I was working on. It's such a different way of writing, first of all, but also it's so collaborative writing in Hollywood. Um, certainly if you're in a writer's room on a show, but in every stage of it, when you're developing and you're getting notes from studio executives and network or streaming executives and, and your agents and your managers. So it's like really, um, you're hearing a lot of voices, a lot of them you have to tune out, some of them you don't because they're, they're smart, but it's, uh, and then when you're actually shooting something, I mean, the great thrills of Dare Me, we're working with these different directors and a cinematographer and the costume person, they've all really understand the story and they're pitching ideas and coming up with magical things. I mean, not to mention the cast. So it's, 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 that's collaborative in the best way. That's the imagination, all this imaginative energy. Um, and then the novel is like going back down to a mind shaft by yourself, <laughs> but you can do whatever you want. You don't have to think about what it costs. You don't have to call up the studio and say, can I have more money for another football game? <laughs> you know, so we know need to shoot at that stadium again. You, you can do anything. So having, to, being able to seesaw back and forth between the two has been, has been great because you're, you're not trapped in either one for too long. You weren't worrying about the snow budget. It wasn't oh, like, oh, no, no. no. I'm going to face that. <laughs> but is there ever this moment of like, uh, I remember somebody saying to you, and now, Megan, you're going to go home and write alone. <laughs> like now you're by yourself. And there's that thing of being in the writer's room where you're bouncing ideas off of each other. And, you know, when we were in the pandemic, everybody went home and was working by themselves. And there wasn't that, hey, do you think this is a good idea? Except on Slack, a lot of typing, you know? Yeah. So is it, when you go in the room, it's like, okay, I'm here. It's me and my laptop. Let's talk. You know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, most writers at heart are, especially novelists, let's say, are introverts. So it's actually always, I'm always happy to not have to do that. Um, there is something, not, not when I had my own writer's room, but being in a writer's room is intense and it's a little stressful and there are a lot of ego blows and you're really, um, it is like the, um, team energy and you yeah. do 
I, I always wanted to be the top of class. So always, um, so there is something so um, nice about not doing that um, and going going back into the cave, so to speak. Um, it, it's a different, it is a sort of big stress ball, right, for TV, um, and, but it has so many rewards, including health insurance. So. <laughs> health insurance rewards, yeah. And it's, it's also, somebody was explaining to me when you're shooting a series, like there, um, one is airing, two is this, three is this, oh, you're shooting yeah. everything out of sequence and trying to put it together in your head. I remember once um, Dennis Lane had said he was writing something for The Wire and he was, I'm only writing this. I'm only doing like the baseboard. Like that's my only job. And then I can go home. Like I, they only need me for this dialogue bit here. So yeah. it's bringing the right people in for the right things. Yeah. And you never leave set when you're the showrunner. So it's like 14, 15 hours a day. So you're literally, sometimes you're, fi you're writing in the little chair behind the monitor and that's when you it is more like journalism in that way um it's like having to you know sort of hope for grace under pressure uh um and uh yeah the adrenaline is is uh, you know awesome but i don't need that much adrenaline. <laughs> and also i mean just be so glad you weren't doing that this year where there'd be so many stops and starts and i think it is I don't think people really quite comprehend of when you're trying to do something of that magnitude and it's stop and start and who's not available. And there's so many people that have people keyed up to be in shows, be in movies. And now where is that all going to be? Like, are you going to do Batman or this show? Are you going to do this one or that one? And it's yes, the business side will, will give you headaches for days. <laughs> and think about it for books. This book happened. It could be written, edited, cover designed and in the store without any of that, without any, it could just move on seamlessly. And it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it you know, literally one actor having, um, you know, getting the flu really does change everything or what your camera operator slips, you know, like it can really, it ha, it could, like the, immediately the budget balloons out of control. There are all these other considerations because you're, you're working with a hundred people. And so, mm -hmm. yeah going back to one for a while was was kind of a treat well before i did this i made documentaries when i was at a magazine and what so i know that you're going to miss the plane and then you're going to miss this opportunity and who is this person and are they going to say the right thing and there was this one woman we shot we're shooting these women in their 20s and this one woman stood up and says you know my name is stacy lazier and i blow up buildings for a living and you're just there like thank you for saying that that's the line. Like we don't, and there's moments when you're doing that, that you're just like, okay, we can cut. We just have what we need. And then there are times that you're there 12 hours and you have nothing. I mean, you just start, the sun is setting and you have no more minutes. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's that constant tension. <laughs> we need to make it to the next location and we're in LA and there's going to be traffic. You know, it's like, there we go. So this time you've got this virtual tour lined up so with some big names in the thriller world interviewing you. And typically you wouldn't be doing this at a live event. You'd be up talking at a podium and then you'd go sign. So what is it, this I feel like is gonna have more of the feel of being at a book convention, being at Bowser Con, being at a thriller fest, something like that, where the authors are all in conversation with each other. Is it something you're looking forward to talking to all these different friends and fellow writers? Definitely. I mean, I wish we were all at the bar at BoucherCon doing it, but in the absence of that, I mean, I've done a lot of them this past, during the pandemic for, you know, writer friends who've had books out. And it's really, really fun because you wouldn't have these pairings if in real life. But I miss so much um, uh, being with the booksellers um, and talking to them and hanging with them and having them like, you know, hand sell me some books. And I do miss having conversations with people that came to the event or they just stumbled into it that I mean I that I do miss so much so I guess it's like we're, we're experiencing a lot of trade-offs in the last year and a half um but um you know getting to talk to you know Gillian Flynn and Laura Lippman and Al Fair Burke and Room on the Lawn last night I mean those are really wonderful things yeah and they understand what you're doing so them I think them having a conversation with the reader to for the readers is a completely different thing what I am loving about the virtual events is we have a number of readers who will never go to a live event simply because it will never be near their home or they can't go out in the evening and what I've loved is I have always gone to author events when we were in the city but now I watch a lot more 
I mean, I catch a lot more events. I find that before we do these interviews, I try to watch what people have done to make sure it's something different. But I feel like even watching the interactions, there was one author who I toured with and I went to like eight or nine events of hers and they were all completely different according to who brought what to the party. Yes. And I think that's so much fun for the readers right now. Absolutely. You know, I mean, writers asking other writers questions I always am interested in and the way that a writer reads another writer's book, the things that they notice, they tend to be very different than, you know, so it, I, have, I have loved that about it too. And I do think it's so wonderful. And not everyone's so lucky to have a great indie bookstore within, within an hour of where they live. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's great. It does make me wonder when we do have some more live events again, if some people though might go that didn't normally go, but has enjoyed the virtual events and, and might, if there's an author they love. So hopefully what this does is just create more options. Well, and I'm also hoping that the live event, somebody did it the other night, I think it was Mysterious Bookshop. There was the live event and they were videoing at the same time. So you could have the virtual and the live experience. Yeah. Questions were coming from both. And I found it really interesting because sometimes you just can't get out at night at seven o'clock. You just can't be someplace. Or there are the nights and you've done these events where it's pouring rain and no one is going to show up. But this is a way to not have a loss on that event. Like I'm doing an event tonight and I said, you can video it and run it for the next, like till the end of September, it's a preview event. And so no matter who shows up tonight, the library will have another opportunity that, I don't know. So once this heavy month of touring and talking to your friends is over, is it back to script writing or what's next for you? Yeah, I have a lot of things that need to turn in script wise. So there, no one's happy uh, on that end about this month for me. But but I also, yeah, I have started a new novel and I'm very excited to get back into that because um, it has a has a little energy for me, which is always what I'm looking for. Sometimes it doesn't. So so I'll be I'll be back at back at the grindstone um, come September 1st. So are you a book a year? Like, will this be next summer or YouTube? Oh, no, oh, no. I, I think, didn't think so. I didn't think so uh, with everything you've got going on. I know, but typically I've been every other year, but this has been three years since my last book now. And I think it'll be closer to that um, for me. Um, I think I think that works better for me. <laughs> I'm in between. And it's funny, it didn't feel like three years. I feel like I read the other one like 20 minutes ago. So don't worry about it. It's not like I forgot your name in between. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It was uh, I, I've wanted to talk to you for years because I've been such a huge fan and to hear the whole process behind the scenes is just wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. And for your great questions. This was a great time and hopefully next time in person. Hopefully next time in person at the bar. Okay? Yes. I'll, I'll buy. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us and to our readers. Look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to.